Retired now as a longshoreman, he walks almost every day through Golden Gate Park, about two and a half miles. He sees or hears some little thing. An idea begins to be born. He may jot down a short note about it. A special set of muscles in his brain holds the idea, refines it, maybe for a week, a month, a year, before he writes it out in a paragraph. Then one day, people here and abroad read it with a startled sense of recognition that this is original, profound, and simple. Some people call it genius. One day this summer, we had a talk. Mr. Hoffer, you've written a great deal about leisure. Doesn't it seem to you that free time now is the privilege of Everybody. more of the working class? It's the higher you go in a business, Absolutely. the less time you have. I of guess. course, America is yeah. for the poor, Mr. Severide. Only we have, have a good time in this country. The rich have it much better elsewhere, better service, more deference. Yeah. Even Russia, the rich are better off than they are here. And certainly the intellectuals are better off everywhere else. You know, it, it's the only people who really feel at home in this country are the common people. America is God's gift to the poor. See? And that's why, for the first time in history, the common people could do things on their own. Oh, this is, nobody mentions this. We are a business civilization, this civilization, but this is the only mass civilization there ever was. The masses, Mr. Severide, eloped with history to America. And we have been living in common law marriage with it, you know, without the incantations of the intellectuals there. I think in one of your books you said that uh, a mass society like this is not conducive to producing an effective or powerful intellectual group. But then in, the, in your last book you say the intellectual is really coming into his own, a kind of a rule in this country. Uh, are, you, are you contradicting yourself here? No, or? I'm not contradicting myself. You know, since Sputnik, this is how history is made. Sputnik, what is Sputnik? A little gimmick. You know, the nature of a society is determined by the direction in which energies, ambitions flow. In other words, by the tilt of the social landscape. Yeah. Now, up to recently in this country, the tilt was towards business. Business. Absolutely. No matter where you started, you wound up as a businessman. He will collate and combine factories, mines, uh, uh, railroads, the way that a philosopher uh, generalizes ideas. Suppose you lined up uh, 20 years ago, you lined up a businessman, and a painter, a poet, a sculptor, a professor, and you got you got a beautiful girl to pick a husband. Chances are she would have picked the businessman. Right now, don't be so sure. She might even pick the poet. Mr. Hoffer, you seem to have a fear about the rise of intellectuals in political political life and power. Why, why are you so frightened of it? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, I ought to tell you that I have no, <coughs> no grievance against the intellectual. All that I know about the intellectual is what I read in history, what, and what I saw, how I saw them perform, you know, in our time. And I'm convinced that the intellectuals, as a, as a type, as a group, are more corrupted by power than any other human type. It's disconcerting, Mr. Severi, to realize that power, that businessmen, uh, generals even, I mean, soldiers, uh, men of action, are less corrupted by power than intellectuals. And in my new book there, I think I elaborate again and again, and I give an explanation why. You, know, you take a, a, a conventional man of action. He starts right if you obey, huh? but not the intellectual. He doesn't want just to obey. He wants you to get out of the need and praise the one who makes you love what you hate and hate what you love. In other words, whenever the intellectuals are in power, they're tolerating.